Please join me in the call to worship. We gather this morning to find joy and comfort in one another. Come, let us worship together. Good morning, Birmingham Unitarian Church. How are you? Good. It's a wonderful morning to be alive. It is good to be together again. Whether you are joining us here in the sanctuary remotely via Zoom or you're watching the recording later today, it is good to connect with you. As a multi-platform church, it is important for us to build a bridge between online and in-person participants. We call this connection opportunity greeting our virtual neighbors. First, we will project the image of friends who are currently on our Zoom screen and ask them to turn their screens on and give us a wave. Good morning, I see you. <laughs> now, we are gathered in person. We'll turn and face the camera and wave back. Whenever and however we connect with BUC, we are building the beloved community. At home, on campus, in the world, every day, we are building Birmingham Unitarian Church and the beloved community strongly. We light our chalice, the symbol of Unitarian Universalism around the world. We join with other Unitarian Universalists as we light our chalice whether they be in a, an individual's living room as a small starting group, or whether they be in rented facilities because they've outgrown the living room, or whether they be in a sanctuary, we greet them all, acting together for the improvement of the universe. And now please join us in singing our first hymn, number 115, in the gray hymnal, God of Grace.
The theme this morning is of no surprise. <laughs> it's patriotism, what it is and what it might be. Now to uh, introduce the theme, I think of the time when I was, get this, uh, there was a time when I was five years old. <laughs> I know that's hard to visualize, but uh, it's the truth. And my parents took me from our farm into the local city nearby to see a July 4 parade. Now, of course, I'd never done that before. So we got to the uh, street where the, parade, where the parade was to come down. And we waited, I think we waited 10 hours. It's, it was forever we waited. <laughs> we waited. We waited and we waited. And finally, I heard music in the distance. And gradually the music became louder and louder and louder. And then in front of us was a high school band, complete with drum major, in regalia that uh, would make them happy if they were on the football field. And they passed and then there were people with signs and there were uh, Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts and various organizations were represented there. Uh, and then I heard music again in the distance, gradually getting louder and louder. Brass, drums coming finally in front of us. And again, another drum major, another uh, <laughs> group in regalia. And then police cars and fire engines blaring their horns. It was glorious, glorious. And they all passed. And then there was nothing. We had hit a high and we had hit a low. The mission of Birmingham Unitarian Church is to be a free and welcoming religious community that it encourages lives of integrity, learning, service, and joy. One way we live out this mission is by giving half of our weekly offering to a nonprofit organization that shares our values and addresses needs in one of these areas environmental action, economic justice, civic engagement, and racial justice. We support a new organization for a longer period of time. From now through July 9, our collection recipient is Freedom House Detroit. Freedom House Detroit serves individuals and families who have fled from persecution in their native country and are seeking humanitarian protection in the United States. 70% of its clients are victims of torture. Freedom House provides stable housing, legal aid, mental and medical health care access, and employment training while people await appro approval of their asylum application. Because of its comprehensive and integrated care model, 85% of its clients exit with jobs and move into independent housing. BUC has supported previous Freedom House projects. Our donations at this time will help build a new kitchen for this facility, which serves about 50 people every day. Let there be an offering in support of our beloved community and an organization that builds the world we dream about. This morning's offering will now be received with gratitude. Ushers, please come forward.
We are a church of open minds, loving hearts, and helping hands. With gratitude for this wonderful music and also for our offering this morning, we dedicate ourselves to its service. Each Sunday morning, we invite members of the congregation and friends to bring to our attention joys and sorrows in their own lives. By doing this, we re-emphasize the concept of community in the faith that we propose. There are two joys and sorrows to bring to you to this morning. I begin with the joy, which is from Jane O'Neill. Jane writes, I am so grateful for the work of Pat Hammer, Alan and Letha Craig, Ernest von Houghton, and the inestimable Kimberly Campbell in watering our new native plantings in front of the church. It's nice to see the plantings, but even nicer to work with friends, to plant and water them and see them grow, supporting our pollinators and our earth. The sorrow is from Maura Jung. She writes that Kurt Jung passed away from terminal acute myeloid leukemia on the morning of June 11, while holding hands with his wife, Maura, and daughter, Laura. In the past, he had been a Sunday school teacher and was active here in several groups. Kurt was married here at BUC 25 years ago. Now take a moment to think upon not only these things, but upon your own lives. What has recently brought joy to you? Has there been any sorrow moderating your joy? Life goes from one to another from sorrow to joy and joy to sorrow. It is simply the way life is framed. We ask in times of sorrow how we can be helpful, what we can say, and more than that, what we can do what we can do to the living as they go through torment of illness and death. Please take a moment now to think in silence about these things as they affect you. We'll join in the singing of Comfort Me.
speak for me. Speak for me. Speak for me. Speak for me, oh my soul. Speak for me. Speak for me. Speak for me, This morning's reading is from Amanda Gorman. Amanda Gorman is a young black woman, the first person to ever be named the National Youth Poet Laureate. You may, call, you may recall her performance during the President's inauguration. Mr. President, Madam Vice President, Americans, and the world. When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never-ending shade? The loss, we a sea we must wade, we've braved the belly of the beast. We've learned that quiet isn't always peace, and the norms and notions of what just is isn't always just is. And yet the dawn is ours before we knew it. Somehow we do it. Somehow we've weathered and witnessed a nation that isn't broken, but simply unfinished. We, the successors of a country and a time where a skinny black girl descended from slaves and raised by a single mother can dream of becoming president only to find herself reciting for one. And yes, we are far from polished, far from pristine, but this doesn't mean we are striving to form a union that is perfect. We are striving to forge our union with purpose, to compose a country committed to all cultures, colors, and characters of man. And so we lift our gazes not to what stands between us, but what stands before us. We close the divide because we know to put our future first. We must first put our differences aside. We lay down our arms so we can reach our arms to one another. We seek harm to none and harmony for all. Let the globe, if nothing else, say this is true. That even as we grieved, we grew. That even as we hurt, we hoped. That even as we tired, we try. That we'll forever be tied together, victorious. Not because we will never again know defeat, but because we will never again sow division. Scripture tells us to envision that everyone shall sit under their own vine and fig tree and no one shall make them afraid. If we're to live up to our own time, then victory won't lie in the blade, but in all the bridges we've made. That is the promised glade, the hill we climb, if only we dare it, because being American is more than a pride we inherit. It's the past we step into and how we repair it. 
We've seen a force that would shatter our nation rather than share it, would destroy our country if it meant delaying democracy. And this effort very nearly succeeded. But while democracy can be periodically delayed, it can never be permanently defeated. In this truth, in this faith, we trust for while we have our eyes on the future, history has its eyes on us. This is the era of just redemption. We feared it at its inception. We did not feel prepared to be the heirs of such a terrifying hour. But within it, we found the power to author a new chapter, to offer hope and laughter to ourselves. So while once we asked, how could we possibly prevail over catastrophe. Now we assert, how could catastrophe possibly prevail over us? We will not march back to what was, but move to what shall be a country that is bruised, but whole, benevolent, but bold, fierce, and free. We will not be turned around or interrupted by intimidation because we know our inaction and inertia will be the inheritance of the next generation. Our blunders become their burdens, but one thing is certain. If we merge mercy with might and might with right, then love becomes our legacy and change our children's birthright. So let us leave behind a country better than the one we were left with every breath from our bronze pounded chest. We will raise this wounded world into a wondrous one. We will rise from the gold limbed hills of the west. We will rise from the windswept northeast where our forefathers first realized revolution. We will rise from the lake rimmed cities of the midwestern states. We will rise from the sun baked south. We will rebuild, reconcile, and recover in every known nook of our nation, in every corner called our country, our people diverse and dutiful will emerge battered but beautiful. When day comes, we step out of the shade, aflame and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it, for there is always light. If only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. Thank you, David, for me not having to channel Amanda Gorman at my age. Wow. My mother and father came to the United States from England in the late 1600s. My father was a staff sergeant in the U.S. 3rd Army 65th at Infantry Division of World War II. We never went to parades, like Ed talked about. We never visited war memorials or even historical places. We really never ever spoke of my father's war during my childhood home. Patriotism was not any of those activities. Patriotic was duty to earn a living, educating yours and mine, and caring for others, especially older folk. We never flew a flag on our house, decorated with festive red, white, and blue, had dishes of red, white, and blue to eat from. We never celebrated Memorial Day or Independence Day except with street fireworks that we created as children, despite the fact that four of five men in my father's family were soldiers and my mother was in charge of an ammunition plant during World War II. This daughter of the American Revolution, descendant of the greatest generation, protested the Vietnam War, mourned the death of MLK on the steps of a university library. I wasn't thinking of patriotism with my choices or my actions. Not unlike my parents, it was my duty and value of responsibility and ethics and continuous learning. 
Patriotism is the ins and outs, the ups and downs. Patriotism evolves as people learn. Well, what is patriotism and what might it be? I think we see it when it's deeply successful and we also see it when it's deeply flawed. I begin with literature and history, no surprise to you. Do, doing so to establish what it's not so that we can better get reflexively a good understanding of what it is when it works well. So let's turn patriotism on its head, upside down for a few minutes. In that upside down state of patriotism's greatest goal, which is service to others, becomes the goal of serving oneself. The me becomes the center of the universe or at least of the relationship with others. When patriotism is reversed, instead of giving to a country, a person finds every way possible to have others serve him or her or them. I want to begin with a vicious, vice-laden, corrupt, murderous man who became king of England. Richard III is a fascinating man enlarged by Shakespeare. That means that it's, Shakespeare used him as a foundation for what he wrote. A man whose thirst for power was his overwhelming motivation for everything he did. He turned upside down the biblical admonition to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Well, last summer, the Shakespeare Festival in Stratford, Ontario, the director of the play, Richard III, prepared the lead actor in a new way. Now, ordinarily, Richard is a hunchback. But in the Stratford presentation, Richard has only one good leg. And the other is dragged about the stage. But no matter how a director chooses to visualize physical deformity, it is primarily shown to suggest moral depravity. Now, please understand that this is not my theory. It was, uh, however, common parlance in Shakespeare's time. So Richard simply cannot carry himself as able men can. But as the play goes on, we learn more and more about moral depravity. Dragging a leg as one walks is an even more abundant way to present moral turpitude than would be the hunchback. Now Richard speaks in at least two ways. He speaks in soliloquy to the audience and in doing so, speaks honestly about the way he sees things. And second, in discussion with others, of course, on stage. In soliloquies, he speaks honestly about himself and his intentions to grasp the crown by killing or having others do his dirty work for him. In the end, he is responsible for the deaths of 12 people including two children, all of whom had some relationship to the throne. Now, Richard's power lies in part in his use of language for his own purposes. In Act 1, Scene 2, Lady Anne is conveying her late husband's father to his grave. She knows that Richard is the one who killed him, and that Richard also killed her husband, Prince Edward. With loathing in her voice, 
She calls Richard a devil and she spits at him. But Richard uses flattery. Ultimately, even though Richard himself can hardly believe it, his flattery has worked very well. And he says, almost to himself, was ever woman in this humor mood? I'll, I'll have her. <laughs> but I won't keep her long. Uh, enough of the picture of a would-be leader who is also the ultimate anti-hero, the anti-patriot. The good news is that Richard's reign lasted only two years. His life ended on the field of battle. His horse had been killed. And Richard's foes surround him as he cries out, A horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. And they kill him. Now, with that in mind, allow me to jump ahead just a few years to 1919. And I, the, the, the First World War has just ended. Now remember, of course, everybody knows the phrasing that the First World War was the war that was going to end all wars. A little problem. In the First World War, uh, there, there are statistics that I find almost incomparable. When you put both sides together, the soldiers, there were eight million soldiers who died. Eight million soldiers who died in that First World War. And of civilians, there were 14, uh, 13 million who died when you put both sides together. Now, William Butler Yeats, the Irish poet, found himself almost in a state of depression during and after the First World War. He wrote a poem that I'm going to quote only nine lines of. It's called The Second Coming, which I urge you to look it up on your own. Now, the only word that'll give you any problems is gyre, G-Y-R-E. What on earth is a gyre? Well, a gyre is a form of energy, essentially, uh, which you can hold in your hand. It's got a, a very small diameter. And then as it circles and circles and circles and circles and circles, it gets wider and wider as it goes higher and higher. So this is Yeats. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things Fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction. And the worst are full of passionate intensity. 
surely, surely some revelation is at hand. But happily, there are many who are, on, who are the heroes of past and present. Abraham Lincoln is a good example of a man who led well and honestly as president. He spoke of how a country could not exist half free and half slave, even though his main goal was not, when the Civil War began, to free the slaves. In January of 1863, Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. The document says, in part, that he orders and declares that all persons held as slaves henceforth shall be free. And upon this act, sincerely believed to be an act of justice, warranted by the Constitution, Upon military necessity, I invoke the considerate judgment of mankind and the gracious favor of Almighty God. And then there's one other patriot who lived at the same time as Lincoln. I refer to Ralph Waldo Emerson whom you've all heard of and some have read. Emerson was a Unitarian. His father, a Unitarian minister. Emerson himself went to Harvard at the age of 14, which in our minds is pretty young, but actually that was the age that most people went to college in those days. Waldo, as he preferred to be called, was uh, quite a good student. And as a graduate student, he earned a degree in theology and performed ministerial duties for seven years, thereafter making his living by writing and lecturing. Now, Lincoln had attended one of Emerson's lectures, and that may have smoothed the way for Emerson to have a conversation in the White House with Lincoln early in the Civil War. If we look at, chemis uh, at Emerson and the times in which he lived, we see such things as Charles Sumner, a United States Senator, physically beaten because of his strong abolitionist views. There are men, Emerson wrote, as soon as they're born to take a beeline to the acts of the inquisitor. Wonderful the way in which we are saved from this unfailing supply of the moral element. And a bit later in his life he wrote, we must get rid of slavery or we must get rid of freedom. Now, of course, Waldo wanted the revolution of freedom to come about by peaceful, morally inspired ways. But by 1860, he had concluded in a lecture at the Smithsonian the South calls slavery an institution. I call it destitution. Emancipation is the demand of civilization. And the next day, Emerson met with Lincoln. Now, we have every right to be proud of Emerson as a moral patriot a moral patriot, as well as a Unitarian. It is unambiguously so. Or take President Roosevelt, who on the one hand, in his administration, administration started Social Security, and who led the country through the Second World War, 
and did so as far as I can tell without making it a cause for his own greater good. And did you notice, if you watched the crowning of King Charles III, his statement that his duty, his duty, is not to be served, but to serve others? May there be tangible results to that end. So, where does all this leave us? What does it mean to be a patriot? Flag-waving is so much fun, but it is superficial as superficial as the statement, I love my country. Well, it's nice that the speaker does love his, her, their country, but what does one do for it? What, was, what does one do about loving country? Now, the analogy that I have come to like is that one should treat the country as one would care for anyone who needs help. Even for anyone in his own family. Now in the words of Marilyn Robinson, human beings are sacred, therefore equal. And she goes on to write, this country was, from the outset, a tremendous leap of faith. We tend not to ponder the brutality of the European world at the time our colonies formed, so we have little or no idea of the radicalism not only of stating that men, our creatures of God, are equal, but given the idea of profound political consequences by asserting for them unalienable rights. If we learn anything, now listen closely, this is a great part of this quote. If we learn anything from history, it should be that rage and contempt are a sort of neutron bomb in the marketplace of ideas. I love that. Rage and contempt or a sort of neutron bomb in the marketplace of ideas. Well, I hope we can all learn how to live together, which these days is very, very difficult in this country, very difficult in this country. I hope we can learn to accept the premise that we are all, all, all sacred human beings. Thinking of the analogy of patriotism with family. Ask, what would you do for your child who's hungry? Would you not feed him? If thirsty, would you not give her a cup of clean water? If wearing rags, would you not clothe her? Or turn the image to a 10-year-old boy who becomes embittered on the playground and strikes out at another boy who had been his friend. When you hear of that from the teacher, what do you do? Do you say, well, it must have been his problem, not yours, Jim? Or do you take it realistically and try to help him, try to talk to him, perhaps take something away from him for a few hours, a day, and say, you cannot do that. You, you cannot strike out at another playmate, another person. You cannot do that. 
Do not families take care of each other? Do they not act in rational, resilient ways of love? Rational, resilient ways of love with each other. Surely families should love and include resilient reasoning in the treatment of children and partners. And surely a family relationship with our country can also be a new and effective way of making patriotism real and deep. Love, 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 and resilient reasoning, reasoning, reasoning. What a combination. The two qualities can and must go together. Love is a wonderful commitment. It's a wonderful feeling. A feeling of connection, be it to someone else or to something. But if love has only some small application of reason, there is a good guess that it will fade and that the commitment that I love you can become a feeling of the need to separate. Treat our country then as you would treat a family member. That is the search for patriotism. Be grateful for the good and the true. And when there are problems of division in family or country, then seek answers to why, to how, to what it is that is problematic. You would do that in family life, and by extension, to our relationship with our democracy, that great experiment of government and of family. May it be. Please join now in our closing hymn to be announced by Amy. <laughs> our closing hymn is number 331 in the gray hymnal, Life is the Greatest Gift of All. Please stand as you're willing and able.
we come now to the end of our service and the time when we can go out into the world and serve the world, serve the community, serve the family, serve others than ourselves. May this be our charge, and now we extinguish the flame, but keep it going strong in your hearts. Blessed be and amen. <laughs>